Hello everyone, this is Gary Reinhardt from Heart to Heart with Gary Reinhardt. I am here with Caitlin Stewart, District Manager of the Hamilton County Soil and Water Conservation District. How are you doing? Hey Gary, I'm doing great. I want to give a big shout out to everyone in Dakland Radio Land this evening. Boy, you know, I just rolled in here and it's pouring rain, 60 degrees. We had about an 11 degree temperature drop today. This cold front front's blowing through and... Hopefully we'll be able to welcome summer and... I should hire you as the Dakin Radio Weather Girl. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> it seems to be a recurring theme because the last interview I had was with Patrick Krause and it was pouring then too. We just can't get away from this watery Seattle type weather we've got this year. Gary, you need to bring the sunshine on, <laughs> man. You need to bring it on. Oh, I know. It's just... it's. Terrible. All right. So, for those who are avid Heart to Heart with Gary Reinhardt listeners, might remember uh, a year ago, I had you in and we talked about invasive species, which is a big part of the Soil and Water Conservation District. But we also have a bunch of other things, too, with different programs and such. Uh, one such thing is hydro seeding. So maybe you can explain that to our audience. Great. Thanks, Gary. Yes, another one of our prongs, in addition to invasive species, is erosion prevention. And one of our main programs that we utilize for preventing erosion is our hydro seeding program. And our district technician, Lenny Crute, heads up the program. And he has a big tank that's pulled behind his truck. And in that tank, he puts grass seed, mulch, straw, fertilizer, and a tactifying agent to help everything stick on the ground. And this program is used to to stabilize everything from roadside ditches to critical areas to lawns and to overseeding as well. Now, this process promotes seed germination very quickly because it injects the soil with this amazing package of nutrients for the grass seed. So the grass seed becomes very quickly established. It's with the hydro seeding, the the spray out of the hose allows for a much more uniform application. And Lenny utilizes a cross-hatching pattern to make sure he gets all angles of soil to promote the best seed germination. And this is great for roadside ditches and to really help grass establish on some steep banks. Yeah, so it kind of makes sure that the soil doesn't fall like into the ditch and uh, just... Uh, fall away, I guess. Absolutely. Be- and the issue with that, if you were if you were doing road work and if you were just to leave those those road ditches bare without any type of seeding, all of that soil would wash into the ditches and through a culvert and eventually drain into our lakes and that's filling in aquatic habitat and impacting the water that we drink and enjoy to swim in. It's decreasing the water clarity. Yeah, now the most, usually when I hear of uh, soil erosion is usually around summertime out west where the trees get burned and then without the trees keeping the soil to the ground then they have mudslides and things like that. So this is the same thing, but like probably on a smaller scale, not expecting any mudslides to come through speculating. Right, right, absolutely. But you don't have those deep roots from the trees to hold the soil in place. So it's it's important that you get some type of root system established, which is what the grass provides instead of those trees. And that's probably that light bluish turquoise stuff that you see on the ground. Yeah, it's this the- Gary, it's this awesome turquoise color you can't you can't miss the color of that you know where Lenny's better around the county because you'll see this bright green turquoise color on the on the soil all right so uh, everybody look out for that um something i have heard from the library is you're doing a presentation on bats yes now when i was in boy scouts we actually had a special every year they would do a thing on bats so they'd wait till about dusk 
and you could see the bats going from tree to tree, and the guy would explain things. That's so the cool. Bat. Yeah. So explain what exactly your program is going to be like. The focus of this bat program, uh, the full title is called Bats, the Misunderstood, the Important, the Cute. I feel like there are so many negative myths around bats. People freak out that they're going to fly in their hair and all bats carry rabies. They really are an asset to our environment because they eat thousands of insects a night. They have voracious appetites and they do incredible things for our ecosystem. They disperse seeds that they eat, so they help to regenerate forests, and they are awfully cute. And not to give away the full presentation, but my last slide has some super cute bat photos. Aww. So, you know, you think about Dracula and the, the Hollywood movies, bats really get a bad reputation. So the goal of this program is to allow people to take a different, softer side view towards bats and to realize how important they are. Um, then we definitely could use more because the bug situation has been terrible this year. Do you have a lot of bites? Ah. Uh, I have bites on my legs. Uh, Steven Rika, who works at the inn, has he's just covered in bug bites, and it's you don't know what to do. You put the bug spray on. Sometimes that doesn't help. It's terrible. It's been very bad this year, and I think it's and you probably could expunge upon this probably because it's been so wet. So that's helped them grow. And yes, their habitats are persistent with the pooling water and the adults are laying eggs like crazy and there seems to be no end in sight for the black flies and now the horse flies and the deer fly are coming out yeah there's probably a combo of just all the rain we've gotten plus this winter we had a lot of good snow so then as that all melts and that pools so we've had a lot of good uh, water from the snow you got it. So it's definitely been uh, a very wet uh, 2019 so far. Yeah, but, yeah. But uh, I would love if we could have some bats eat those bugs because they've just been atrocious. Mm -hmm. atrocious so far yes and i want to give a shout out to the lake pleasant public library for inviting me to speak and this talk will be held on june 28th from 6 until 7 p.m so i hope to see you all there it's going to be a fun fun and informative night excellent yes and if you want more information of course as she said you go to the uh, lake pleasant public library open every day except sunday they also have you on the scrolling sign out front. So You know you've made a big one. You made a big when you got the scrolling sign out front. Love our libraries. Yeah. Now what kind of bats do we have around here if you We know? have an endangered bat called the Indiana bat. And due to habitat loss, the the populations are very low, so that's our one endangered bat. Also in the Adirondacks, we have little brown bats mm -hmm. and um, a couple of other species, too. Well, you should probably tell the Indiana bats that this is New York. That might help. <laughs> <laughs> Put them back with, like, oh, man, I thought this was Indiana. Our bad. Our that's bad. right. That's right. <laughs> All right. Um... You also have the Arbor Day Poetry Contest. Now, if I remember correctly, my dates are, my dates are okay, but uh, Arbor Day is in August? Actually, it's in April. April? Yes. It's usually the, the last week, the last week, I think it's that, last Friday in April. That's right, in April. See, I, always, I get my, my holidays mixed up. So, it's, all, it's all good. All right, so it was the last week in April. And you had a poetry contest. You got it. Yeah. So what were the outcomes of the poetry contest being that, I guess it's already... <laughs> right, right. This is a program that has been around for 11 years. And it's geared specifically towards our senior citizens. And every year they get totally amped about it. Usually around January, I start to get the emails coming through. Hey, Caitlin, have you picked a theme for this year yet? Or what do you think of modern allergy poems? So they're giving me topics, which is fabulous. It makes my life super easy. And let me tell you, these seniors 
are really into this contest. So this year's this year's theme, uh, the style of poetry was haiku. So they wrote haiku poems. Uh, it's a uh, an Asian style poem with uh, the first, uh, just a simple three line poem. The first line has five syllables. The second seven, and the third five. And uh, this year's theme was wildlife in trees. And our winners, we chose a winner from each community that entered. So the first place winners were Mary C. Randall of Wells, Diane Benton of Indian Lake, and Bob Tice of Long Lake. And each community, uh, we hosted an award ceremony and everyone who participated received a certificate and our overall winners received a special certificate and a bundle of trees. Excellent, excellent. Now, there's something, uh, we, we've talked a little bit before and that just brought me up with the trees, is that you had your annual tree sale and for those who weren't here around that time, it was actually snowing the day you were trying to sell trees. I was bundled up in three or four layers. I had my hat on. I had my gloves. The snow was blowing outside. Lenny was up in Blue Mountain Lake. So there was about, you know, a five degree temperature drop up there. It was insane. This weather has been just totally crazy. So we're, we're having our tree sale in the middle of a snowstorm. <laughs> quite a lot because I was going to work and I saw the sign you had at the end of the road that said that there was the tree snow. I'm looking and it's snowing and it like ended up being like an inch and I'm like how do you have a tree snow? When it's snowing like this. Oh, it it's was... crazy. But let me tell you, it was all good because I met up with my dad for lunch at the inn after the sale. We had some nice tomato soup. I had a blue cheeseburger. And you can't go wrong with their Bloody Marys. So, oh, you, you know. You can't. You can't. Really, really warmed up well after the snowstorm tree and shrub <laughs> sale. <laughs> all right. Well, also on our list of things is we have water tests. Now, what are the water tests all about? Yes, our water testing program is a program that we offer annually, and our district holds it from May through September. And landowners, municipalities, and business owners can pick up a kit at any local municipality or right at our office. We keep our lower entryway unlocked 24-7, so they could come at 2.30 in the morning and pick up a water testing kit. And the idea is to make certain that the water people are drinking and swimming in is safe. So this program specifically tests for bacteria and the nasty bad guy, E. coli, that causes a lot of human intestinal issues, things like that. So we have a couple of drop-off dates, and people can check our website for those. Our next drop-off date is coming up a, actually a week from today, June 17th. And again, this program is to ensure that drinking and swimming waters are, are safe for our residents and for our visitors. Now, what kind of test is the water test? Is it like one of those strips that you put under the water? Good question. The samples are taken in a sterile plastic bottle. And so, you know, the people will open up their taps for a couple of minutes, they'll let their water run, they'll take the screens off of their faucet, and they'll take the water sample, they deliver it to the district. And we actually partner with the Mohawk Valley Water Authority in Utica, and all of the analyses are done there in-house, and uh, the authority offers certified results. So if people need this for realty purposes or for their businesses, those results are certified. Now what can someone do if their test comes out positive for right. E. coli? So if uh, bacteria or E. coli do come up on their tests. The Mohawk Valley Water Authority will send specific instructions about how to clean their well. Uh, bleach is is used to, to cleanse the well and then they'll take another test to make sure that all the bacteria have been killed. 
Now, is it very difficult to clean a well? Or, I mean, my well's underground, so it mm -hmm. seems like I'd have to dig pretty far to go clean it. Right. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. We have instructions on our website, too, that people can check out. Excellent. Could you quick give us the website? Uh, just uh, Yeah, sure. People can check us out online. Our website is www.hcswcd.com. Excellent, excellent. Um, but now, you had, or you just re recently completed a 25-year lake monitoring report. Uh, what is this all about? Yes, we uh, the report was prepared by Paul Smith's Adirondack Watershed Institute, and the report compiles 25 years of data that the Hamilton County Soil and Water Conservation District has collected. During the summertime, staff travel to 21 lakes in Hamilton County, and they collect water samples at the deepest point of each lake, and those samples are analyzed for parameters like pH, conductivity, dissolved oxygen, phosphorus, nitrates, and a couple years ago in 2015, we just added sodium and chloride to monitor uh, the impacts from road salts. Yeah, I feel like I'm in biology at class. Uh, Are you getting negative flashbacks or positive flashbacks? <laughs> Are you well, freaking out? <laughs> no, no, Mr. Pruden was an amazing. Was he the uh, man? He was a great biology teacher, but that's a lot of stuff to, to, to take in for, for someone like me. It's just like a layman just listening to it. Uh, have there been positive results to our tests or... Yes, so the, 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 the great news is that the report indicates our lakes are recovering from acid rain. So the, the emission standards in the Midwest, where a lot of our pollution comes from, those standards have gotten more strict. So with, with these regulations, less pollution is being emitted into the air and that pollution normally would be blown by the prevailing winds, hit our Adirondack Mountains, and rain out as acid rain. So because of those higher standards for those emissions, less pollution is entering the atmosphere to begin with, less acid is entering our lake ecosystems, and we're seeing a recovery, which is fantastic news for our fish, it's fantastic news for our aquatic ecosystems. You know, I remember in uh, probably in, in middle school with Mrs. Loria, she had sp spoken about how the natural jet stream kind of goes through the Illinois Chicago area, which kind of then comes up into our area. So it's a lot of that stuff gets into the atmosphere and then comes up over here. Mm -hmm. uh, That's it, absolutely correct. Yep. You know, is it difficult to work with other states? Um, to, you know, because their, I would say, you know, their actions are affecting our nature, so it feels like we should be working with them and saying, hey, we need to do this because it's affecting us. Right, a lot of these stations, a lot of these regulations are taking place on a national scale, so everyone's getting a little bit cleaner, which is, which is great. But you're right, you know, what, what one area does impacts another and that's a very important point to keep in mind because there's the old saying dilution is the solution to pollution that's not the case no. we're all in it together excellent now what can people at home do to help uh with their local environment not only around their house but maybe in a wider spread area oh that's a great question simple actions holistically make a big difference. Something as simple as cleaning up your pet waste on the lawn. If you live near a lake or a stream, when it rains, that waste is being carried into a water body that you drink from, that you swim from. People may draw that water to cook from. So as something as simple as picking up your pet waste makes a big difference. Planting what's called a buffer zone along lakes for our lakeshore owners. 
uh, things like sh uh, native trees and shrubs will create a buffer zone and their roots will suck up pollution before it ever enters a lake. Um, I always keep reusable grocery bags in my car and I travel everywhere with them. So I always have them with me, always shop with them. And I know this sounds crazy, but whenever Matt and I go into town to get ice cream at King of the Frosties or Lakeside Licks, we carry our own spoons and our own bowls. So that's creating less plastic and less and less less waste. So so say that everyone did that. Mm -hmm. Those impacts will add up super fast. So speaking of that, something uh, I've noticed eating at Oak Mountain for the past few weeks is the use of paper straws. Now, I myself have not had great success with the paper straws. I have uh, not either. Oh, oh, they're terrible. Or at least adjusting to them. And I applaud Oak Mountain. I do. I really do. I, I applaud Oak Mountain for moving towards a more sustainable, um, I guess, I mean, you would call it like sustainable waste. You know, they use the cardboard instead of uh, styrofoam, using the paper straws. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just something I haven't gotten used to yet. Right. And I've, I've tried a few times, and then I, uh, actually I'm trying to learn now how to drink soda without using a straw at all. So. Right. It's, it's changing our habits. It's saying, you know, I don't need a plastic bag at the store when, when you know, the checkout people are really trying to give you a plastic bag. I've had instances where I've had to say no a couple of times. It's it's breaking that habit, which is so hard to do. The Oxbow Inn, they're another local restaurant who are moving toward moving away towards straws. And they're making green strides in their restaurants as well. But I totally agree. The paper straws, thumbs down. I prefer to go strawless. Or you can bring your own. There are uh, some BPA-free plastic straws that are awesome, dishwasher safe. I have a, a stainless steel cup that I carry my smoothie into work every morning, and it has a reusable straw. The plastic BPA-free straws are awesome. You know, I have my Yeti uh, container, which keeps anything cold or hot, depending on what what it is it's really good it's expensive but it's really good at that and i've heard of metal straws that people can use that are a little bit of a pain to clean because you gotta actually get a pipe cleaner and get in there mm -hmm. but uh it, to me it would be a lot better than paper when it kind of breaks up and for sure it starts, it starts now uh, a word to the wise with those stainless steel straws i okay. used to use them and um i actually chipped a tooth on one Ooh. so be mindful if you decide to use the stainless steel straws um, i find the plastic is is much much more forgiving <laughs> on my teeth <laughs> yeah i definitely cannot afford any more dental uh work on my mouth right now so maybe maybe i'll just stick to strawless <laughs> there, there you go there, or try the try the bpa free plastic excellent excellent <laughs> Are there anything else that's kind of going on right now? Yes, so super exciting. We have a new district technician who comes on board this Wednesday. Her name is Alex Bielli, and she has interned with our district two summers in 2016 and 2017, and we are thrilled to have her on board full time. She recently graduated from SUNY Environmental Science and Forestry with a degree in environmental education, and she's going to hit the ground running on Wednesday. Her workday is going to start at 7 o'clock, and she and Lenny are going to hit the lakes for some monitoring for... For our for our lake monitoring program. Excellent. Now uh, something a little off topic, but still on topic. Uh, recently, our kids from the ninth grade at Lake Pleasant were uh, crowned national champions of the wind power uh, competition in Texas. Uh, how important is something like that to try and educate our kids about natural? or reusable energy such as the, the wind. I mean, number one, I'm very proud of the kids that they were able to win a competition like that, especially for such a small town like ours. 
and to be able to come up with such great ideas. Yes, absolutely. You know, kudos to their teacher, Vanessa Saltes, for taking this competition on year after year and for bringing our students to the forefront of, of a sustainable competition. The importance of something like this so what Vanessa has done with her students is instill a sense of stewardship and, and pride in caring for our environment at a young age. And studies have shown that education at that grade level is important because you will make lasting impacts as these students become young adults and, and are past on whatever we leave to them. Exactly. So I really feel like it's instilling this sense of importance for protecting our natural resources. Yeah, and hopefully it'll uh, bring on some maybe future engineers that will invent the next wind turbines and things of that nature. And speaking of stewardship, as someone who, I, I am an, uh, an Eagle Scout, uh, when I hear that, I always think of camping, which is um, an exciting time. It's a relaxing time. It's fun. But at the same time, as someone who's also worked at a campsite, it, if done incorrectly, can be very messy and it can be very harmful to the environment. Do you have any tips or anything like that for people who are camping? I know there's always the... Um, the saying, whatever you bring in, or whatever you, yeah, whatever you bring in, you take out. So yep, pa pack it, pack it in, pack it out. You know, if we could all leave the campsites a little cleaner than we found them, that would make a big difference. You know, having, having the foresight to maybe carry a couple extra trash bags with you, make sure that you clean up all your cans and all, and all, your, all your bits and pieces of trash. Make sure that your fire is put out before you leave the site. And... A lot of invasive insects, critters like emerald ash borer, Asian longhorned beetle, Cyrix wood wasp, these critters are moving around in firewoods. So if you pull into a DEC campground, you may see signs that say burn it where you buy it. And in New York State, there's a, uh, a regulation where people cannot move firewood within beyond a 50 mile radius and that is in place to prevent the movement of these invasive insects from place to place they're hitchhikers on firewood so support your your local businesses who are selling firewood places like camp store places like the mom and pop um you know stands along the side of the road as you're pulling into the campground Pick up some firewood on your way and don't bring it from home if you're more than 50 miles because you could be carrying an unwanted hitchhiker. Yeah, of course. Yeah, each, I believe each DEC campsite has their own pallets of wood, which they get within the 50 mile radius, which are checked. They're all checked by an inspector and they put a sticker on it. It's like, this has been checked to be good wood that does not have an invasive uh, species. And I would suggest that before you buy firewood, make sure that the person who got it, got it within the 50 mile radius, which for us would probably be right around Mayfield. Mm -hmm. Let's probably say Mayfield, North Creek, um, a little past in mean, Long Lake. Mm -hmm. that Poland area. area. Poland. Yeah. So that would be kind of in that 50 mile uh, radius area. Mm -hmm. yeah. And these, uh, just, just uh, uh, kind of bringing it back to the invasive insects, these critters are killing our trees, and they're killing our trees in great numbers. A lot of them don't have any known control methods. So once they're here, they're here to stay. And we're dealing with repercussions to our maple syrup industry, our baseball bat industry, furniture. They have a lot of of adverse environmental impacts. So that's why it's important to be savvy and, and to, you know, to, to not move firewood more than 50 miles, to pick it up at a local vendor and to burn all of your firewood and not bring it home with you or leave it for the next camper. Now, something that's coming back this year and that has been discussed in the Lake Pleasant town board meetings, if you're listening to that on Daclan Radio as well, 
had to get the, the cheap plug in there. I listen. <laughs> is the boat wash that is very important in getting rid of the invasive species that may have come from a different lake, from a different area. Um, I'm not exactly sure how many they have this year. They were still discussing where and when, and, but I do know they are up. Um, I remember working at Moffitt's, they had one, or they at least had an inspector there from Paul Smith's. Mm -hmm. And they still have an inspector there again this year. Excellent. Yep. They had, one of the washes was at the turnaround on Route 30, if you're going towards Wells, that direction, they had one there. And that wash station is still in place for this year. So it will be there for, for this year. And I believe the wash station that used to be at Pasico Common School, I believe that is now at one of the DEC campgrounds on Pasico Lake. I'm not I'm not 100% certain, though. I know that the town of Arietta was working with DEC to get it moved to an actual campsite. I'm not sure if that happened or not, though. I'll have to talk to my brother, who's the caretaker of Little Sands. He'll probably... Oh, super. He'll give you all the information. Yeah. Um, now... Actually, that is a, a good point. Who would I talk to if I wanted to find a wash station of this nature? You would go to the Adirondack Watershed Institute's website, and they de they they deploy the the lake stewards who who inspect the boats for aquatic hitchhikers, things like Eurasian water milfoil, zebra mussel, spiny water flea, and then they will direct you to a boat wash station if your boat needs to be cleaned. Yeah. Now, somebody that uh, comes up a lot in these conversations is Paul Smith's College, which is a local, co well, a, as local as you can be around here. How big of a help has Paul Smith's been in... Uh, your line of work. They are fantastic partners with Hamilton County Soil and Water Conservation District. Our technician is in constant contact with the Adirondack Watershed Institute for the most current water monitoring methods uh, in everything from how to collect the water samples to you know, to um, to preparing the water samples for Paul Smith to analyze our samples, um, questions with species identification. They're fantastic. Yeah, it's just they've become an invaluable source of uh, information and being at the forefront of uh, environmentalism, especially here in the Adirondacks. And I just hear their names a lot when speaking about uh, these different things. So I want to give some kudos to Paul Smith's college for being at the forefront of environmentalism and helping keeping the Adirondacks uh, green. And also uh, Jamie Parslow, who is uh, who works for the Adirondack Watershed Institute, she participates in our conservation field day and will often speak about aquatic invasive species, watershed pollution. She does a great job for our fifth and sixth graders. Yeah. It's good to teach the young, like you said before, teach the young kids uh, the importance of the environment and that it can't be taken for granted. It can, it can be taken away from us if we don't take care of it. So uh, that's why I and marvel at the job that you do, that Lenny does, that all the Thank other. you. I really do, as, especially if someone... Who's you know has grown up here and has joined nature as a Boy Scout, Eagle Scout, uh, just a regular, just driving through. It's uh, very comforting knowing that we have people who are so enthusiastic about this and really trying to keep the Adirondacks looking as good as it does. So I want to thank you. And if Lenny is listening and all of them, that we really do appreciate everything you guys do. Thank you. And shout out to Marge Remus, too. She's our clerk. She's amazing as well. All right. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about tonight or uh, maybe a little wrap up on uh, everything we've talked about? Yes. As, as we're heading from spring into summer, changing seasons, hopefully drying out a little bit, I want to encourage everyone listening at Dackland Radio to reach out to Hamilton County Soil and Water. Our staff members are well-versed in invasive species, erosion control, and water quality. We offer site visits for people who are struggling with drainage 
issues or something funky is going on with their grass or their tree is dying. We have partnerships in place. If we can't answer the question, we know who to ask. So we want to we want to let our our listeners know that we are here for all of your natural resource needs. So keep those those inquiries coming in and we truly are here to serve you and to serve Hamilton County's natural resources. All right, once again, just to uh, make sure everyone got it, what is the website? That people yes, can our website is www.hcswcd.com, and our phone number is 518-548-3999. Nine one, And you can also connect with us on Facebook and Vimeo for some videos. Well, thank you so much for coming in, Caitlin. I'm, it's just been an honor to talk to you about all this. And once again, thank you, everybody, for listening to Daclin Radio. Uh, I hope that your summer goes really well and make sure that what you take in, you bring it back. And always make it look a little nicer than when you saw it. And as always, I will see you all next time.